welcome to our virtual fireside chat. We are happy to have you here with us for this Startup Grind event. I'm Ulrike Witzmann, co-director here in Munich for Startup Grind. And together with my team, I'm looking forward to the next 75 minutes with our guest today, uh, Inas Nurelin, co-founder and CEO of Tomorrow. But before we start with the main part of our evening, we want to give you a short overview on Startup Grind. So what is Startup Grind about? Startup Grind was founded in Silicon Valley in 2010. It's the largest independent startup community actively educating, inspiring and connecting 2 million entrepreneurs in over 600 cities. Um, we nurture sta the startup ecosystem in more than 125 countries with events, media and also partnerships with organizations like Google for Startups. And the cornerstone of our global community are regular events where we are featuring successful local founders, innovators, educators, and investors who want to share their lessons learned. For example, like our guest of this evening. So um, also who are the faces behind Startup Grime Munich? You can see us here on the slide. It's uh, Sabine, Marie, Philip, and me. Yeah, um, for the next hour of the interview, we have a short code of conduct. Um, yeah, of course, we are in the, in the webinar, so your microphone is muted anyway. Um, during our interview, feel free to put in all your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we will have a short Q&A session at the end of the interview, like 10 to 15 minutes. Um, Sabine will also moderate that one. And yeah, and also for your information, the video is recorded. Uh, you can see it afterwards, afterwards also on our YouTube channel. Great, then um, I would say let's get started with the main part of the evening with our fireside chat. So, um, <laughs> hi Ines, welcome to our virtual fireside chat and thanks a lot for being with us. Um, as a short introduction for all our attendees tonight, um, um, after your studies, you co-founded co already your first company, a cloud software company, which is today the market lead in food chain traceability. And after your exit, you decided to stay on the path of social impact entrepreneurship and co-founded Tomorrow. Tomorrow is building world's first sustainable digital bank. And I've seen today that uh, <laughs> just today you have launched also your new website and your new um, corporate design. Congrats for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we will talk about that also later um, when we are talking about marketing and positioning a bit. And yeah, before we are hopping right into the, the first question, um, we also want to get to know our audience a bit better. So we have prepared also a poll for our attendees to make it a bit more interactive. So the, there are two questions. Um, which role describes you best and sustainable banking ever heard before? So um, while we are waiting for the results of this first poll, um, Inas, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and also what brought you to the idea of building a sustainable bank. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, warm regards um, from Hamburg. Um, so I'm um, basically joining from our office um, here in the middle of, of Hamburg. Yeah, so my name is Inas. Um, I'm one of the three founders um, of Tomorrow. And um, yeah, as Ulrike already described, um, I think in her introduction, um, I, I, I founded uh, another company uh, right out of university uh, when I, I was a little bit younger with a, a little bit less um, a shorter hair before Corona. 
And um, yeah, I was basically founding um, I'm, I'm, I'm a startup in a completely different um, space before, uh, doing cloud software for big uh, food uh, companies, trying to make their uh, food chains more transparent, tracing back the product to the source where it was originally grown. And I grew up that company for around 10 years. We had a team of 100 people. And um, somehow I had a feeling I needed to do something different after um, 10 years and was also searching for more purpose in the, in the work I, that I do every day. And my wish was really to found something that is digital um, in the heart, but has a um, positive social and environmental impact. That was always my dream to combine um, those two things combined with um, entrepreneurial passion. And so I decided to then leave actually my, my own company, um, exited the company and then took some time off. And then basically got into the topic of finance because what I wanted to do is basically invest money for myself and also for my family. And sustainability has always been a very, very important um, aspect uh, for me. And so basically with the money that I wanted to invest, I want to make sure that it's not only going to help me uh, when I retire one day or my kids, um, but that I actually don't uh, harm the planet with my investment. And when I looked at investment products out there, I was really shocked what kind of negative footprint uh, investments leave. Um, and it's quite absurd to think that you invest into your own future and at the same time you destroy the future of our planet. And um, then I said, well, there must be a better way. And there are already some sustainability banks out there uh, in Europe and in Germany, but it's really a niche phenomena. Yeah. And uh, so the question was, how can we take the topic of um, sustainable finance to use every euro that sits on a bank account, create positive impact and not invest it into old um, fossil fuel based, carbon based uh, or weapon based economies but rather invested in renewable energies, sustainable agriculture and some other positive industries and make positive change happen and take it out of the niche into the middle of society and use technology to make it really, really big and have a big impact. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started then uh, tomorrow. Um, I did it with uh, two of my friends together. Mm -hmm. Before we hop into that a bit more in detail, uh, let's have a look at our poll. Mm -hmm. So, one third of the people are from startups. Um, there are some people from corporates, consultants, mm -hmm. students, so very mixed, very good mix. And the question about sustainable banking. Oh, yeah. So nobody said never ever in my life. <laughs> That's <laughs> got quite a good um, base. But the half of the people said, yes, there was something. So they heard about it, but actually they, I think they are not so into it, so much in the details. Um, so that would be also a good uh, starting point for my qu next question. So as I remember from our pre-talk, um, none of you founders had mm -hmm. quite experience in the finance sector. So where did you start? How did you start? So at first, actually, we wanted to do something a little bit different because we, we first thought that we would um, actually build an online platform and um, sell investment products. And, but then somehow found out that it's really hard in Germany to, um, uh, to get people ambitious uh, and motivated to invest into financial products and doing that um, online. And uh, that people are quite lazy when it comes to investing money. And then actually what happened that we looked at what could be a really interesting angle to enter the market because the, the customer acquisition costs, for example, if you look at so-called robo-advisors that sell investment products online are extremely expensive. So they pay you know, between 150 euros up to 600 euros per customer that you need to acquire. So it's very, very, very difficult. And then we talked to a lot of potential customers and found out that actually they, they wanted to have a less high entry barrier and try something out. And then we felt that banking is actually the, the, the right uh, thing to start with because it's 
uh, less barrier. It's basically, you know, you can put five euros on, onto your account and you have a card, you can go to the cash machine, take out the cash again and realize, hey, the, I'm, I'm getting the money back. And so you build trust. And uh, it, so it's totally different than investing 5,000 euros right away. And however, we never thought of building a bank. And uh, for, at first we thought, well, that's a pretty much crazy. But then, you know, the whole banking um, landscape to totally changed because nowadays there are platforms um, that call themselves banking as a service platforms. So there is, for example, a player in or like a fintech in Berlin called um, Solaris Bank. And they're providing an out of the box service that you can uh, connect to using an, an, an API. So they take care of the whole core banking about the deposit protection of 100,000 euros per account. And so we are able basically to very quickly prototype uh, with the solution, test it, and we figured out it worked and then uh, take it uh, from there step by step. Because typically, like if you wanted to do the same thing like we are doing now, 10 years ago, we would have needed, I think, around 20 million euros just to finance, you know, the first year. Because getting the, the banking license is so difficult, actually, in Germany. Mm -hmm. Uh, you already mentioned now the, the entry barriers, that it yeah. should be quite low. And do you think that do you think that the barriers are quite low already in the in the field of digital sustainable banks? Or is it still hard for people to find a good sustainable bank if they want to? I think um, if you look around, I think there are a couple of uh, sustainability banks out there, but I think it, you can compare it very well to traditional banks, right? Mm -hmm. The traditional bank is basically based on, on the fact that it's a physical building, you know, where you go in and then you fill out papers and you deposit money there and you go there to pick up your money. And um, so they're based on that concept. So they're not very digital. And I think uh, if you look at the sustainability banks out there today, um, it's, it's very hard, I would say, uh, to just go there and open an account because they're expensive. They make it hard for you in the onboarding process. And then once you successfully manage to open your account, then you look at their app and you're quite frustrated because it's not what you expect um, from a 21st uh, century digital product, uh, basically. And so I, I would say that the traditional banking players are really having a hard time changing their IT infrastructure and coping with the new expectation of, of users to have everything really totally convenient and the user experience is great. Everything is real time. And so that I would say for the, for the existing banks, it's very hard to, to scale. But on the other hand, of course, for new players, I would say the entry barriers are much, much less nowadays. Now, if you compare it, of course, to traditional new banks entering the market versus like us, we're also a new bank, um, um, like a new bank, combining the aspect of sustainability, then we're trying to combine those two um, together. And of course, if you talk about sustainability, it's about creating positive impact. And I think it's about credibility and trust. And so you need to build a trust, right? And you need to be totally transparent, I think, so that customers actually uh, trust you. And that's something, of course, you cannot build up that easily. It needs time. And you need to show that you um, um, deserve uh, the trust of your custom base. Mm -hmm. um, concerning transparency, I think we have to go once step back because um, my question is also for our audience. We also have prepared a poll for that. Um, my feeling is that many people don't know what's happening with their money uh, when they make deposits into a bank account. So that would be actually also the question to our audience. Um, what is their point of view at the moment? But also the question for you, um, green banking, sustainable banking, what does it actually mean if you have to describe it in very short, I don't know, three, four sentences? Yeah. So, so I think we are all becoming more conscious about uh, the impact of our day-to-day -day purchasing decisions, right? I think we are increasingly buying organic food. 
uh, we're maybe into ethical clothing. Uh, we think maybe favor an electric car or even uh, don't use a car at all and use a bicycle. But when you think about banking, a lot of people don't think that it's actually, you know, or there's also a way to have positive impact uh, with it. And if you look at how banks typically work, um, so every euro that you deposit on your current account or that you invest into an investment product is used by banks and banks hand out loans or invest into companies. Mm -hmm. And um, so they can also do that with part of the money that you have um, on, your, on your bank account. And the question is, what do they fund? And typically um, banks, they're a black box because you don't know, you know, uh, what's going um, on inside the bank. So you don't know, are they financing a weapons factory? Are they financing at the school next door, which would be awesome? Or are they um, financing a, a coal-based ener energy uh, producer, for example? Um, or, you know, um, an industry that you're not totally okay with. So it's the first problem, it's totally intransparent and most banks have a horrible negative footprint. And on the other hand, so sustainability banks, what they do, first of all, they make it transparent. So you can see in real time uh, what we do within our app. We have an impact board where we show, show our customers in real time what the money does, where is it invested, and what positive impact does it, does it create. And so we make sure it doesn't go into this negative um, industry, but on the other hand, make sure it creates positive impact. It goes into forestation projects, it goes into microfinance, it goes into renewable um, energy projects um, and, and, and sim, sim, similar projects. And by this, you create a huge impact because money at the end of the day keeps, keeps the world running and the world economy running. And so I think it's a huge impact where we direct our money and what is it that we finance with. Mm -hmm. um, you just mentioned that sustainable banks are making transparent where they where the money goes um yeah when we now look at the answers of our attendees um many of them said okay um i tried to figure out what mm. sustainable banking means or where my money goes but it was quite complicated and intransparent um yeah so i think that just maybe pr proves um proves the fact that um, I think typically banks are um, are based on the on, on the fact that they don't want to disclose information right they don't want to disclose information um, on how much money they make they don't disclose information on where they invest the money mm -hmm. and so they're very detached uh, to their customer base basically and I think that is really a problem and that's how we're used to it and we're trying really to change that and make the bank much more approachable. So it starts with, of course, uh, we are showing on our website, for example, also in real time, what our money does and where it flows. And we also show in real time how many customers we have right now. We show how much money we have in total on all bank accounts together accumulated. Could, could, you, could you tell us a number to have kind of a feeling? Mm -hmm. how, how so, yeah, so I, I basically, um, we have uh, roughly around 50 million euros as deposits. Um, so the, that's basically the money that our customers have put on their on their bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And we have um, slightly above uh, 30,000 customers um, um, right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can watch that um, almost in a live feed on our website, how this, how this number grows. Um, and you can typically see that at the end of the month, uh, the number drops a little bit because uh, people are consuming their money. And then uh, right when the salaries come, it jumps at the very end of the, uh, of the month, it jumps again um, up, for example. So we're trying to make that transparent. And it's not only about the money, I think. We're also trying to give people much more insight on what's happening behind the walls, yeah, so to say. Mm -hmm. We try to connect with our community, invite people to our office, um, you know, have frequent uh, Q&A sessions to basically really to make everything more transparent. Okay, so it, that means as a customer, um, I could come whenever I want to your office and ask some questions? That's also possible. Yeah, totally. After Corona, 
I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, totally. That's 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 one way of doing it. But what we do, we try to do it actually typically in a more organized way. So we have regular meetups, okay. both dig digital ones as well as um, on-site hosted ones, uh, where we invite our community, where we have certain, you know, um, in-depth topics um that we discuss uh, so for example we had one uh, topic around you know what is really the impact we're generating we had another session on how can we help our customers for example reduce their co2 footprint mm -hmm. uh, while making purchases so we had a you know um, a talk with our community to to check options for example how can we use technology Mm -hmm. to enrich the transactions that you make yeah so we have a you know like a debit card uh, like a visa card that you pay with and uh, basically this reflects your purchasing behaviors mm -hmm. so we said why not you know if we uh, use that data and show the user give them feedback on what's the co2 footprint of their purchasing uh, decisions mm -hmm. and so we had a meetup uh, you know to discuss that and what's the feedback of the community how can we develop that feature um, that that feature uh, together um, and yeah, really trying to um, to include the community also in the ideation process and the development of features. Mm -hmm. So, would you say um, doing these meetups is um, on one part, on one on the one hand, part of your yeah getting to information for your product development? But would you say it's also a channel for doing marketing or getting new customers? Um, or, yeah, I, I, yeah it's, it's, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. So maybe the first thing it's, um, um, I think the most important thing is to listen to your customers, right? And um, when we started tomorrow at the very, very first, um, in the very first days, we directly set up a beta community, which is very un untypical for a bank, right? You know, beta communities typically... <laughs> from other tools, et cetera. But when you talk about a bank, a beta community is pretty weird because who wants to test a beta account where you don't know what's going to happen? And so it's we have money. several, it's your money, exactly. And uh, so it was really from day one uh, when we launched our account that we first started with a couple of hundred users who voluntarily wanted, wanted to use that. How, how did you find these beta testers or customers? They, the crazy thing really was that, um, you know, we set up our website and we had a landing page um, describing the project we, uh, um, we are planning. And there was like um, an area where, where uh, potential interested people uh, could, could sign up. Mm -hmm. And then we had like a waiting list. So people could sign up to that waiting list um, and be informed, yeah? And so basically what we did, we sent uh, then an email uh, to this waiting list and Basically, within, I think, two or three days um, after, we had to close the beta um, uh, adoption because so many people voluntarily, uh, you know, said, yeah, I'm so happy to help and I want to be the first to, to test it. It was really o overwhelming and um, yeah, um, quite a cool experience. So it's quite astonishing. Let's see, there are people out there that really want to be included, that want to help, that want to contribute. Mm -hmm. And to use the power is, um, is, 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 re is really amazing. Yeah. And I think to the, to the second part of the question, does it help with marketing? I think and the, at the end of the day, if you really want to grow and especially grow organically and don't spend too much money on your customer acquisition costs, then you need to base your model on such a way that it's such a cool product, such a cool brand that people fall in love with it mm -hmm. and are so happy to talk about it to their friends, invite their friends, uh, you know, that you have this um, referral mechanism that is really taking off. And so I would say, yes, it, it's definitely helping and um, helping with that. Okay. So what, um, hopping on this fact, um, would you say that you're more, focused on inbound or outbound marketing in which part are you talking um, about? It's, it's always a little bit of both i would say but it's um, definitely um i would say most of our of efforts are in an done in an organic way yeah okay. so it's really existing customers uh, that recommend it to their friends invite them to join and um it, it, it's really amazing so 
We have, for example, we just discovered two, two weeks ago, um, we have one of our users who's working um, at a kindergarten um, and uh, she has been so crazy and successful referring um, tomorrow to other people that she managed alone to attract 120 new customers um, 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 to us. I was really amazed that this is actually possible. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I think that's, that's maybe the cool thing. If you also do something with a purpose at the, at, at the, at the center of your business model, uh, because you you really inspire other people, yeah. It's you inspire your customers, you inspire your employees, and they're happy actually to share it with other people, trying to maximize um, the impact. And then actually, what what happens? It's not only a product anymore. Uh, it's more like it's more becoming like a movement, mm -hmm. right? Like um, being part of a of a community. Yeah. So I think exactly. we're also talking about uh, as special field of customers. So um, before I ask you exactly who are your mm -hmm. customers, I think we also have a good poll for our audience mm -hmm. because um, we also want to know where our audience um, deposits mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> money. So uh, while waiting for this, um, yeah, Inas, who are your customers? You already talked a lot about people who like to be part of a community, part of a sustainable community. Um, would you say that this is your main, yet yeah, that these are your main customers? So I would say in, 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 um, in Germany, I think we have 20 to 30 percent of people who really want to, um, you know, create positive um, ecological and, um, social impact that are really interested in sustainable products so so generally talking i would say it's a 20 to 30 percent of the of the german population that put or in europe you know um that are, is our target audience however of course um you know we are a mobile first product mm -hmm. um, so you really uh, need to love the fact that uh, you use your um you know your your, your bank um through your mobile phone and therefore, I think as a result, we have rather a younger target group. So I think you could say that 90% of our customers are between the age of 18 and 45, right? Mm -hmm. So that's 90%. So it's a rather younger generation. And, um, and the core target group is really, I think, between uh, 25 and 35, uh, we could say. And unlike some other direct banks, um, we have a really good mix between um, female and male users, which is quite interesting. Because mm -hmm. I think if you look at other direct banks, typically it's, it's a male phenomenon, yeah, because it's very technology oriented. Um, and, uh, you know, especially the, the startup fintech uh, solutions are predominantly used by, unfortunately, by, by male users. And I see what we can say. We really have a 50-50 uh, user group, which is um, um, quite, uh, quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And if I would go into more, more details, I think that there are maybe three user groups uh, that uh, we're looking at. There's something we call the change makers of tomorrow. So that's uh, maybe someone who currently still studies at the, at the end of his, her studies and wants to change the world. Then we have young professionals, you know, who are maybe in their um, late twenties, first job. Uh, they're, um, you know, you know, living in a very urban context. Uh, they're, you know, care about, uh, um, you know, um, um, sustainability. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have the how we call it the green bourgeoisie. So it's it basically maybe the young uh, family um okay. you know mid mid 30s uh, living in uh, in Prenzlauer Berg or in in Ottensen yeah Hamburg um mm -hmm. and uh you know having their Lastenrad and uh, yeah so a cargo <laughs> bike uh, Very, so maybe just <laughs> a lot of stereotypes here at this point <laughs> I <would> say. <laughs> um <laughs> but it's quite interesting because uh, when we're looking at our poll yeah. Most of our 
pe of the people are here are still at uh, conventional banks mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. sustain and online banks and nobody is like at the normal conventional uh, sustainable bank mm -hmm. in case of of creating impact you t talked a lot about impact and 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 get, having social impact part of having social impact is also to to grow and to reach out to yep. a lot of customers so what how would you describe also your your plans and your strategy in case of also maybe facing other mm -hmm. target groups in the future or yeah i think I, at the at the end of the day um we we believe um, in the saying that um if if you want to save the world you need to throw a better party than those destroying it yeah mm -hmm. And I think you need to create a better user experience, a better product than the uh, conventional banks, right? And um, I think you can also compare it maybe a little bit with, with, with Tesla. Yeah, um, I think uh, it's also a controversial discussion whether it's really sustainable or not, but I, I, I don't want to you know, touch on that. I just want to touch on the fact how they managed actually to take electric mobility out of a niche where it was a very ugly looking car that had a max speed of 30 kilometers per hour and uh, was able um, to host one person, maximum two. And uh, they made the, the, the car with the fastest um, acceleration, uh, really premium and, and great looking and um, highly su successful with that. It's just showing that, um, you know, there is the potential that if you use technology and a cool brand, that there is the potential to take uh, such a topic like ethical or green banking out of the niche, take it to the mid of the center of society and scale it. And that's exactly what, to, what we want to do. And of course, we, we are not happy if, uh, you know, we're going to get stuck with our 30,000 customers. We definitely want, uh, you know, in the next few years to reach at least 1 million customers within Europe. Because if you want to create impact, you need scale. Yeah. Otherwise, as you just said, you're not going to have impact. Then you're in your warm muesli uh, reform house bubble and, you know, not, you're not going to change the world. Mm -hmm. But then at this point, what do you think, what pre prevents customers from switching to a a sustainable bank and how mm -hmm. are you facing that in your strategy in case of you want to grow up to 1 million um, customers or I don't know do you mm -hmm. have a, a fixed milestone for that yeah so that's in the, in the next three to five years three yeah to five years okay e exactly yeah so I think first of all it's um, I think you know within um, the banking industry trust is everything right because you're putting there your money and um, so, and money means a lot to most people. So people are very careful. And um, it's, it's, I think, building, building up a brand that's going to be well known and a brand that people really love. I don't know how many people out there love their current bank brand. Um, yeah, so it would also be an in, in, interesting, interesting question um, um, to ask. And I think there's a huge opportunity um, to build a new kind of love brand within banking because most people, if you ask them about their band, say, ah, you know, you know I'm, I'm with the bank. I really hate my bank and the user experience is horrible. And I know, you know, with my money, they do bad stuff. But uh, it's so hard to change my, my bank account. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so expensive. It's a comfort zone. It's a comfort, it's a comfort zone. zone, exactly. You, you choose your, your bank and then you get stuck there. So it's a comfort it's a comfort zone and that's why we believe we need to make it so freaking easy to change and you know don't even need to change you just you know what we tell um a lot of our potential customers basically just open a second account it, it you know it doesn't cost anything we don't charge you you know um for our free account and uh, you test it out Hopefully you fall in love with it and then gradually you make it your main account. And that's the, the pattern that we can see. And what we can also see that within the first year of existence, we managed basically to get, you know, approximately 30,000 customers uh, from zero, from scratch, 
And we, if we compare that basically to the leading sustainability bank in Germany, um, it's, it's the same growth that they are having after 47 years that we managed to do it within the first year. And we are just at the very start. And so we are very, very confident that we can exfold that growth. And that over, you know, the next a few years, a few years will really be able to, to scale that approach and make it increasingly easy for people to join and to really help people with their finances. Because if you look at the banking space, typically you think about banks of just being an account. You put in, you know, your salary, then you spend money with it, and then you go to the ATM and withdraw some cash. That's it, right? But banking is much more than that. So we want to extend that functionality and basically say, hey, we want to help you with your, fina with your, you know, with your financial future. Mm -hmm. We can tell you, you know, based on your income and your expenses, maybe how you can save money, how you can invest wisely at really low cost. We help you with your personal tomorrow. And beyond that, for example, we can also automatically calculate your CO2 footprint, you know, and maybe if you like, you can even offset it. Yeah. And so basically going beyond the traditional banking and enriching that experience with some new, you know, experience that is not known to banking and by that building up actually an, a uniqueness that people really um, you know, can connect with and say, wow, yes, I really wanna join, join there because it's, it's much more than just a bank account. And I'm helping make the, the planet uh, better mm -hmm. and more sustainable. Maybe in, in that case, um, when people are seeing, okay, maybe people have in their mind, I want to switch from my conventional bank I'm at for, I don't know, 20 years or something. Mm -hmm. I want to switch to a more digital, a more modern bank. And then let's compare it also maybe with other digital banks. Mm -hmm. um, we have N26, for example, and we have uh, tomorrow yeah. at the other hand. And uh, when talking maybe also about people who don't actually know about sustainability that much, and we also saw it before in our poll that many say, okay, I mm. actually don't know what sustainable banking means. Um, what is your strategy in, in case of positioning also compared to yeah. digital banks and also in case of yeah, the fact that many people actually don't know what sustainable banking means? Yeah, so I think I would maybe go one, one step back and look maybe at, uh, on what is happening, right? Um, so I think we all agree that, you know, climate is changing, you know, we have a lot of challenges that uh, we're confronted with. Of course, now we had Corona that is also to a certain degree may also associate with some climate uh, or deforestation, um, urbanization and, and, and problems, all right? But on a bigger scale, I think if you, if you look at Fridays for Future, for example, that whole youth movement, you know, um, I think the awareness is increasing that uh, we need to change the way we're behaving, the way we do economy, the, the way we live. And so increasingly people are becoming more conscious that uh, they need maybe to change um, their day-to-day their -day behaviors. And that is already happening in a lot of you know, areas, I think we, we talked about organic food. Yeah, we can see that trend more and more people are buying organic food. Uh, um, an increasing number of people are changing to green electricity providers, right? And we believe that uh, basically banking is, is the next big field where people are really increasingly interested in, and we can see it because we can see it in our user numbers that they're steadily increasing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's working, there's a, you really shift in thinking taking place towards more sustainability. And that's why we believe that sustainability is not just a niche phenomena, it's total mega trend. And it's a total necessity because there is no alternative at the end of the day, because we all need to switch and behave in a different uh, uh, way and change our economic systems because otherwise we're not gonna have a future, unfortunately, right? And so basically we want to be the pioneers in, in making that scalable. And I would also say if there are others who are going to follow us, that's actually great. Yeah. So 
if we say there is a huge traditional bank that now says, oh, wow, hey, you know what? Actually, sustainable banking is not such a bad marketing move. Maybe we should also become more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know what? The you know, this whole market is so big, that's actually great because exactly that's what we need. You know, that's what our planet needs. And maybe we need also more entrepreneurs, you know, who come up with you know, green banking ideas or other sustainable ideas, entrepreneurial ideas. And um, the, the market is so huge and the problem is so huge and we're not going to solve it alone. Okay. Yeah, but um, one question at this point. Are, mm -hmm. When talking about also other banks, maybe they, they start to rethink or mm -hmm. also customers start to rethink and it's kind of a... Um, yeah, let's, let's say a, a movement that's coming now more and more and the awareness is coming. Are there at the moment any disadvantages, disadvantages for banks, for example, investing in sustainable projects or sustainable companies? Are there, mm -hmm. for example, lower interest rates or something? Or is it, doesn't, or it's the same as um, investing in, in conventional projects or... Companies. Yeah, I would say it's actually the, the opposite. Yeah, so I think what, uh, what, what banks, what investors, I think, are, are finding out that, and uh, I think there are a lot of scientific studies about that, that investment into sustainable projects or company is not worse. It's actually the same or even better. Why, why is it better? Uh, because I think there are a lot of environmental risks, right? And if you look at people like Larry Fink, you know, who's the CEO of, of BlackRock, you know, um, one of the world's largest investors. Uh, he also says that climate risk is one of the biggest threats uh, to our economy. And this needs to be mitigated. And I think at the same time, you can see that companies like in Germany, RWE, yeah, um, energy um, company, if you look at their stock price, it just fell, fell, fell because they just didn't get it that it would be wise, you know, to move into renewable, into mm -hmm. renewables. And I think they can see that it's a huge risk if you don't look at sustainability as a whole. And those companies who internalize basically those um, sustainability elements into their um, strategy are at the end of the day better off because it's the end of the day kind of a risk management um, and practice. Mm -hmm. But what would you say, what are the reasons for most of the banks and also many investors mm -hmm. are still investing in, I would say, non-sustainable projects? Is it because there are I not think... enough options at the moment or is it kind of we always did it that way or what's the reason? I, for think, I think one thing is definitely we always have done it like that and uh, why not uh, continue doing it? Um, it's, I think the same thing with digitization, right? Um, I think if you look at the land, landscape of banks, um, also they didn't get it that it's you know, really time to rethink their, their digitization strategies, right? And they just don't get it, yeah? It's, um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, yeah? I mean, if you, um, you know, use um, some banking apps of traditional banks, it's just unbelievable, yeah? You, you still cannot access your bank statement uh, from four months ago because they're limiting it to, to, to 90 days. And uh, you have to pay then two euros per extra page, yeah? And that, you know, in 2020. And the same thing, I think, with, with sustainability. Um, on some people's agenda, it's still not there. They don't see it. They don't believe in it. They believe it's a niche phenomena. However, I think you can really see it also with some big banks, even with BlackRock, you know, where the CEO Larry Fink, uh, you know, sent a letter to all CEOs of the MSCI World companies, you know, that they have invested in, say, listen, guys, you need to prepare a strategy um, you know, to mitigate uh, climate change risks. And um, so I think there are some people picking it up, but I would say they are not picking it up in a rigid way. You know, with, with some people, it's just to say, yeah, it's there, we need to take some actions, but it's not radical enough. And I think we don't have much time if we want to cope, you know, um, with our climate goals, you know, um, and our sustainability goals. 
And, and that's, I think, why we need much bolder moves. And my wish would also be that someone like Larry Fink uh, from, from BlackRock would, would you know, address his investor companies in a much more radical way uh, and motivate them in a much more radical way um, you know, to switch towards more sustainable strategies. Mm -hmm. well, when talking about investors, um, Tomorrow also raised uh, quite a high amount of money last year. I think it was in November um, from the Environmental Tech Fund in London. So uh, an impact invest fund, investment fund. Um, have you also reached out to other conventional non-impact investors or was it clear for you that you want, just want to reach out to impact-based funds? I think for us, it was very important that we had investors on board that share our vision and that really share our impact vision. And so I think in the first uh, couple of months or in the, in the first um, you know, uh, year and a half, uh, we were mainly funded by business angels. Mm -hmm. And these business angels typically came you know, for the, from the renewable energy sector, from us, um, you know, um, sustainable retail sector, etc. People really, you know, at the heart have built something by themselves um, with, with an impact as well. And then for us, it was very important that we find an investor uh, who also thinks about impact alongside profitability and who shares that common vision. And uh, so we, we talked also with some conventional um, uh, VCs uh, who told us that they also want to get engaged in, in more impact, which, you know, we also agree on this. It's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. But then we have certain things, I think, that we put into our shareholders contract or where we have, for example, also an advisory board or an impact board where we have people sitting on our advisory board that are independent from the founders, independent from our investors. Mm -hmm. Uh, that basically make sure that we also as founders follow through our, our impact vision and we don't uh, sell our souls at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And there's also then some automatic uh, self-selection process with some <laughs> investors who say, yeah, well, that's exactly what, uh, what we want to support as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. With your current investor, do you have like kind of KPIs or something where you also have to report your, I don't know, your impact or how are you mm -hmm. measuring your impact if you have yeah. to? Yeah, so of course we have very strict KPI indicators, I think uh, such as every, mm -hmm. um, you know, growth oriented um, 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 company. And, I'll, you know, when we do our, uh, let's say, monthly reporting, we not only, um, report on user growth and uh, revenue growth and uh, profitability or cash burn um, but we also report on on impact and i think yeah that is for us very very, very important and it's definitely also an imp yeah and and an kpi for us mm -hmm. because at the end of the day we want to make sure that you know we can create positive impact mm -hmm. how are you measuring that impact so there, there are different, um, there are different metrics. Mm -hmm. um, one is, it starts at the very heart of our company. Um, so, for example, we measure our own footprint as as tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, what do we do? One very basic thing, of course, is uh, that we um, calculate our CO two footprint, so the negative emissions that we have, and of the positive emissions that we have, because. Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing a lot by investing into interesting projects that offset a lot of, of carbon, uh, that, you know, reduce a lot of carbon from the air. And at the end of the day, you need to look at the balance. Do you have a positive um, CO2 balance or you have a negative um, mm -hmm. um, and balance? So we have a clear positive um, balance here, I think, which, which, is, which is good. And then even though we are only a startup, um, what we have started is to become B Corp certified. Mm -hmm. uh, so B Corp certification is basically is a kind of certification for sustainable young young companies, and along with it comes also um, a process where we need to report or need to pu publish a sustainability report. So we're now starting the process to um, to publish a regular sustainability report, where we report on everything from diversity within our team, 
gender pay gap, um, you know, and um, the, the measurable positive impact overall that we um, can, can create. Um, so, of course, um, there are also things like tons of CO2. There are also things like, you know, uh, how many households, for example, were we able to help with microfinance loans? Um, so there, there are various and, and, and measures, I think, coming into place there. Are these, uh, do you also report or make this um, KPIs transparent to your customers? Yes, yeah, so there are two ways of how we, how we do that. So first of all, when you log into our app, there is an impact board right at the center of the app. So there you can watch in real time, um, I think, um, the positive impact that we have created. That's one thing. And the other thing is that we're publishing a regular um, impact report. Mm -hmm. I think there is a new version of the impact report going to be launched within the next two weeks from, from today, uh, where we're going to publish a lot of metrics, a lot of uh, visualizations on uh, how we measure um, impact and try to make it uh, also in a, in a visual, nice way so people can actually understand uh, uh, what, what their contribution as well is. Mm -hmm. mm, maybe also talking a bit more... Um, <laughs> about this growth topic you already mentioned before. Um, you said, okay, for you, it's, it's important to combine these two things. Also when talking or searching for an investor, combining impact with uh, growth because you need growth for impact. Um, over the last weeks, I think there was also one uh, buzzword uh, very, becoming very popular, uh, the zebra movement. Mm -hmm. I also saw that you had one first uh, event on that. Um, uh, maybe ask also our um, attendees if they know or if they have heard about the Zebra movement before. Mm -hmm. uh, we started the poll in the background and see if, what are the results, if we have to explain it a bit more or not. Mm -hmm. um, but be before we are hopping into that, what would you say, um, what is your biggest challenge in case of growth at the moment? Or are there any challenges or do you say that you're kind on, on the right way, constant growing or? I, th I think it's a, it's a constant struggle. I think it's, it's really a challenge also to, to grow rapidly because what it also means that you need to build up a really um, high performing team that is totally committed, that shares your values. And I think finding the right people is always a challenge. And then I think scaling the organization as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're doubling the size of the organization, uh, you know, once a year, um, then um, that's... How many yeah, employee, how many, how many people are working at tomorrow at the moment? Just at the moment, we're, we're 50, 50. Uh, 50 people. And um, so if we look at uh, where we were at the... In, end of last year so we were you know we're around uh, you know 25 now we're 50 uh, so by the end of this year i think we are somewhere between 75 and 100 mm -hmm. so this this brings uh, challenges uh, with it so i think scaling you know the organizational structure so that tomorrow really stays you know a place where it's fun to work with and um um, and it is not just scaling 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 at at, at any cost that's not not what we want to do um, and then I think it's always also the question of uh, getting the right funding strategy in place that helps you finance that cost that's in, involved. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, finding, I think, the right path between, you know, your burn rate and finding the right revenue drivers that will help you to shorten the road to, to profitability. Mm -hmm. And I think, yes, sorry. Maybe at this point, um... What are your current customer acquisition costs, more or less? Yeah. So, um, I think the, the, the current customer acquisition costs, they, they range, um, I think, you know, around, I would say they are around 10 euros um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm per, per customer, which I think is... Is it high or low compared in the, in the online banking sector? Or is the it? online banking sector is very, very low. I think traditional banks, um, they pay, you know, between 150 and 300 euros uh, per customer. So that's, um, that's quite, um, quite low. Yeah. But in case of, of 
uh, growing. Are there any, um, I would say, expectations also from your investors that maybe you put more money into marketing to, and have a bit more higher customer acquisitions costs to grow a little bit faster? Or are there any expectations at the moment? I think we, we all have the, the big vision, right, of uh, really becoming the, the largest sustainability bank within Europe, you know, and for us, the, one of the, you know, first big milestones is basically then um, hitting, you know, one million customers, I think, uh, within Europe within the in, in next few years. And, of course, uh, we believe that with our strategy, with the product strategy, with the marketing strategy, with the brand, with the community, that we're able to do that at much much lower cost than traditional banks yeah and if you look at traditional banks most banks are not growing at all anymore right they have mm -hmm. difficulties actually um, um getting getting new, new customers and i think we're seeing that we can grow uh, very healthily and at very low uh, customer acquisition costs um of course uh, we are totally aware that if you um, scale more aggressively and you invest more heavily into marketing that automatically typically the customer acquisitions gonna go um a customer acquisition cost gonna gonna increase right that's naturally nature happen mm -hmm. but we are totally believe that uh, they they're not gonna increase that much and it's still gotta be way lower than uh, that one our um, competition is um is, is, is paying mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a good transition point also to the uh, results <clears throat> of the poll you just mentioned the healthy growth. Um, we had mm -hmm. organic growth at, um, before when we were talking about mm -hmm. it. And many of our guests say, okay, they read about the Zebra move and many also want to know more about it. Um, yeah. yeah. Some also are thinking about the zoo or the zebras in Africa. <laughs> so um, maybe also in, in case of growth and, 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 um, yeah, growth strategy. Mm -hmm. Can you explain shortly what is a zebra and yeah, totally. what is it it's not? First, <laughs> first of all, could you, and there is a zebra right next to me actually. So if you, if you look here and uh, to our nice. office, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my co-worker is a, is a zebra. So. And um, yeah, what, 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 what is it about that, uh, that, that zebra? So typically, if you look at, at, at founders, um, especially, you know, in the last decade, um, typically the agenda of a lot of startup founders was to build the next unicorn and digital unicorn and especially the, the Silicon Valley, you know, um, um, means of uh, building the next, you know, big, uh, um, you know, tech, tech startup was based on the idea of building a unicorn. And a unicorn is based on the idea that the valuation is actually around 1 billion uh, US dollars. That's all what matters. It doesn't matter what you do, what impact you have, but that you have a, a valuation of 1 billion, uh, billion euros. And it's a little bit the, the mentality, I think, that, that Mark Zuckerberg, I think, described very well when he said, you know, move fast and break things, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, unless you are breaking stuff, you're not moving fast enough. Yeah, so if you don't break things, you're not fast enough. And that's a little bit this, you know, unicorn mentality, mentality. And we can see that also with Amazon or you can see it with Uber who managed to become a unicorn. But the downside really was that, you know, breaking data privacy laws, train, uh, you know, breaking um, basically labor laws, um, and, you know, breaking taxation laws. And if you look at the impact side of things, there is nothing about it. There's nothing where you say it's really a measurable positive impact solving a real problem. And that's where we said, and there are some other founders who share that vision with us, said we need an alternative picture and mo motive uh, to a unicorn. And so we said, you know, it would be quite cool to think about a zebra because a zebra, first of all, has a huge competitive advantage in comparison to a unicorn, mm -hmm. that it's real. And because we want to solve real problems. And the zebra is also black and white, meaning it stands for profitability and actually also purpose. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole you know, story around it, what makes the zebra actually better. Uh, and it's a symbol for this new kind of 
entrepreneurial, you know, um, an agenda of combining growth and positive impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that gives uh, the a good overview and um, I could ask so many questions mm -hmm. uh, more on that and also on, on other topics but when I have a look at my at the time I think it's also a good time to take a look at our Q&A box because there are also some people who want to know more from you mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so maybe I hand over at this point to to Sabine, who had a look an eye on the on the Q and A box. Um, yeah, thanks, Sabine. thanks a lot, and um, thanks Inas for all these great insights. Uh, I'm not probably going to follow the full Q and A box because I have also a couple of questions and might uh, bring them into mm -hmm. uh, the discussions. So I think what um, I think the audience would be interested in first, and I think some of the questions are related to this, is how do you actually earn money um, and what type of asset class do you actually cover? Because we've talked about bank accounts, but I mm -hmm. guess you also have projects um, that you finance through uh, micro loans. I've also heard about green bonds and mm -hmm. I guess the audience would like to understand a little bit, mm -hmm. um, even though you're a social startup, you still need to make money. So how does yes, that Yes, correct. <laughs> so what, what are the, the revenue streams, right? Um, so they are basically um, fees, yeah, in, in, in various in various forms. So uh, we have a, a free account to, to start with, and uh, that you can use. And there are certain limitations attached to it. For example, you can only withdraw money uh, three times um, a month for free. If you um, basically want to withdraw more, then you are going to be charged two euros. But we notify you before, you know, via via push message that um, you're going to be charged uh, two euros, so it's very transparent. Um, on top of that, um, we are um, establishing premium um, accounts that have additional functionality. There's one premium account we have right now that's called Tomorrow Zero, mm -hmm. and it's the first CO2 neutral bank account um, actually in what the world. That, what does that mean? <laughs> it means that um, If you upgrade uh, to Tomorrow Zero, first of all, you, you, you get some extra benefits such as a flat rate for withdrawing money at any ATM um, and as many times as you, as you want. And you can create as many saving goals and sub accounts as you want. But then I think the real impact comes from actually saying the average German has a CO2 footprint of 11.3 tons of CO2 per year. And what we do is every Tomorrow Zero subscriber, we automatically invest money actually in, um, in climate protection projects that compensate the 11.3 tons of CO2 per year. Does that mean that my money is invested in these projects, the deposits of my bank account? I know it's part of the subscription fee that you, um, that, okay. that, that you pay. So exactly. Partly been in allocated to climate neutral projects exactly exactly how many of your customers um, of the 30,000 subscribe to tomorrow zero can you share that? At, the, at the moment so we have just recently launched it um, so we have now slightly above 1,000 users that uh, that use that service and um, we are um, in at the moment in the process of extending some of the functionality there and also including it in the onboarding flow, which is not part of at the moment. And then we're also planning to launch other premium features that um, are a bit, bit less expensive um, and, um, but have different uh, kind of feature sets. So I think it's really that monetization experiments that we're trying to see where can we create some additional values for our customers. And I think we're doing a lot of tests at the moment, really trying to figure out what, what makes sense in order uh, to find a viable monetization strategy. And on top of the subscription models, uh, we also have other things in the pipeline. One of the really big things that we're going to launch this year is um, an investment feature. Um, so we're going to have a very low cost investment options where you can invest into sustainable uh, companies so we're going to have like a fund yeah 
Okay, and uh, you, or you're gonna right? follow you're gonna follow certain sustainable companies, or it's actually investing directly into the private companies, or is that on no? The it's it, it's it, it's basically companies are listed on the stock companies mm -hmm. as um, on the uh, stock market. So basically, we're trying to find or create an alternative to traditional ETFs. Yeah. You know. Um, we say it's completely transparent and, uh, you know, there's a clear reasoning of why these companies create uh, a positive impact. And we only invest in companies that create a positive impact and we make it investable starting from one euro and mm -hmm. uh, at very low cost fee. And um, so that's also some driver of, of monetization um, um, for us. And um, that'd be the reason why, and I'm trying to respond to one of the question here, why you have such a low um, investment into project at the moment because this feature is not yet available out of the 53 millions in, in deposit that you get i think only 10 millions are invested into projects this new yeah. investment feature is, is coming up exactly so i think it's a huge impact driver i think because i think we're going to leverage much more um, money and uh, funnel that towards a positive impact because there are certain regular regulatory um, restrictions, of course, where you can also take certain amounts of your de customer deposits and invest them uh, because uh, you need to have cash available, of course, you know, and not directly invested. I think there are some restrictions to that. Plus, I think we're working on also scaling our customer deposits. Yeah. Uh, right now we're around, you know, 10, 10 million, but we're going to increase that big time also throughout the next uh, couple of months as well. But it's 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 a it's a very hard process building that up. You need to do a lot of you know compliance work and put a lot of process in in, in place um, to also um, gradually grow that. And what what typically happens that you know we have a scaling number of customers and what we can also see an increasing number of deposits. So if we compare our average deposits with, for example, deposits of other challenger banks such as N26. It's, it's many times the average deposit that customers put into Tomorrow yeah. than they put into other, other challenger banks, actually. And is that, is that because you think that Tomorrow Bank is replacing all the other accounts of, of a, a person? Or do you think it's coming as a side product? So meaning that um, I'm a subscriber to Tomorrow Bank, but I still have my bank account at, at Deutsche Bank or at, um, um, any mm -hmm. of the commerce bank. Um, is, how do you see this or how is it evolving in, in your opinion? Yeah, so typically what we can see that um, first of all, someone um, opens a second account. Yeah, so, so rarely people say, you know, I'm going to switch from today to tomorrow and move everything over. No, they open an account, put some money on there, make some payments, say, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then gradually they're putting more money. And at the end, you know, they're switching the salary, it, making it their, their main salary account. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can see that every month actually the activity rate is increasing where people use it as their main spending account or as a real salary account. And you can really see that people are testing it out, trusting it, seeing that it's really cool. And then um, the activity is, is actually really increasing. And I guess with the data, you are also able to, um, you know, give back to them in terms of insights on how this, um, their purchasing behavior is uh, um, climate neutral or how sustainable this is because you, you get all the data from the banking account. Yeah, so we, we are in a, in a pilot phase at the moment. We are really uh, trying to calculate in real time the CO2 footprint of a purchase. Mm -hmm. So if you say, hey, let's say you, you, you have a car and you'd go to the gas station, you fuel up your car. And then you, you have to have an automatic calculation that the 50 euros that you fuel fueled up your car is an equivalent, for example, let's say to, you know, 150 kilograms of, of, of CO2. Um, or on the other hand side, yeah, if you um, travel with Deutsche Bahn and you can see that we have a pretty much a climate neutral uh, purchase and trying to make it visible and giving that kind of feedback to, uh, um, to users. So we have a closed beta uh, test at the moment um that uh, that we're piloting this with and we hope that we can you know share it with our community very soon mm -hmm. in, in in terms of investment because i mean i guess when mm -hmm. um you know consumers are putting their money on on, on certain bank yeah. accounts or, or savings they expect a certain return on investment um yeah. when i look at your website and the typical investments that you're proposing between the green bonds or the the mm. loans, or maybe this new approach in terms of investing in publicly listed companies that have a certain yeah. sustainability standard or index um how 
how does the return compare to a normal investment? Um, and is there not um, higher risk because um, this is an asset class which is maybe not mature yet uh, and there is not so much liquidity because the consumer, mm -hmm. because we need consumer adoptions to be able to sell and buy um, uh, the, 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 this asset class. How do you, what's your opinion on this? I think first of all, we, I think we need to differentiate between um, two kinds of investments. Yeah, I think they, they are the investments that we do as tomorrow, uh, for example, with the customer deposits. And there, then there are the investments in the future that our customers will do by themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Where they say, hey, I want to do retirement planning and therefore I want to inv um, invest money. Because we as tomorrow, we would never invest the majority of our money, for example, into stocks. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it's uh, way too volatile and if you want to liquidate the money to tomorrow then you know you have a, a corona crisis or whatever and you have a devaluation of uh of the market capitalization so therefore as as tomorrow the money is only invested you know in super in a super conservative way and that's why we use predominantly green bonds and, and green, green, green bonds, I have the, pretty much the same risk rating as governmental bonds, yeah? And so a very, very low um, risk profile. And at the moment, I think the, most banks are in the dilemma that with the customer deposits that you have, you have to look that you're actually not losing much money because there the expectation is not to make high returns, that the expectation is actually to- It remains liquid. To minimize, uh, to minimize uh, um, negative interest rate, which you have to pay if you deposit it, uh, you know, with a central bank, and to minimize risk. And therefore, that's not a money generation uh, business. Uh, it used to be like that 10 years ago when we have, had diff uh, different interest rates. You were able to put the money with a central bank and get returns. Now you put the money with a central bank and they charge you. Yeah, it's a quite absurd uh, um, um, scenario. And therefore, I think our key promise is that even if we don't find enough um, sustainability projects to invest the money right away, we park it with the central bank, right? And we really make sure that we don't put it into some, you know, creepy right. business uh, where it creates negative impact. So we say either it creates positive impact or it stays with the central bank and it's not being touched basically, yeah? But now if we move on to the investment that our customers can do. The ETF. There, the ETF uh, um, kind of, of investments, sustainable <laughs> ETF, something that in that direction. There is a different thing. Um, it's more risky, yes, but they have much higher returns. And I think their studies show, I think everybody knows with a little bit into finance that on average, the economy used to grow on average, you know, six to seven percent in the last, last decades. And if you would have invested with an average into an average ETF, you would have made a return of approximately six to seven percent per year, which is pretty awesome, actually, right? And what we're trying to do is do the same thing, but with sustainable investment, because we're saying if you invest into sustainable companies, they're definitely not going to have a worse uh, um, um, performance. They will have the same performance, if not even a better performance. I wouldn't necessarily say it's a better performance, but I would say it's not going to have uh, less, 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 less performance. And yeah. I, I think there is maybe an opinion in the audience from Jorger, which is um, uh, basically saying that maybe sustainable investment is rather long term because it's maybe mm -hmm. a little bit more of a long term future. So how do you see this? Uh, how do you yeah. maximize returns then in that case for those short term, more quick um, investments? Yeah, I, I think sustainable investing totally contradicts with, uh, with uh, short-term investing because <laughs> short-term investing, yeah, short-term investing is a lot of uh, speculation, yeah, and maybe even buying, you know, uh, call options and put options and uh, derivatives and, you know, all this, um, you know, financial products that also helped create our last uh, financial crisis. Um, and um, so that's definitely something we're not, we're not doing, yeah, we're not betting uh, on, um, you know, on, on, on companies say, no, we invest into companies and we want to be part of a company. And we believe on the long run, they're going to have the better business model than, um, than other, other companies. So therefore I'd say, yes, um, 
we're not doing uh, speculation. Therefore, yes, to a certain degree, uh, you might do higher returns on the short term with speculation. Uh, we're not in that business. But if you say, hey, you want to plan your investment for your own retirement and you have a time horizon of, you know, seven to 10 years where you make a savings plan, then um, I'm, I'm very confident then that we have a similar um, performance, if not a better performance than the average market performance. Than the, the, your other established uh, banking competitors, although they, they might be exactly. able to offer a wider range um, of, of asset class. But mm -hmm. I do understand that maybe some, some banks will have a, a sustainable strategy, even maybe the neo banks will have at some point this type of, of feature. How do you, like, what is preventing them from coming into your area? Um, I think at the end of the day, nothing is really preventing them. And I, I think, first of all, it would be good if they would maybe more go into, into that direction. I think at the moment, I think the question is always around co consistency. Yeah. Um, because uh, I think it's it's a little bit maybe if you you compare it with uh, with Aldi and Lidl and you compare it with uh, with a bio company uh, or an Alnatura, right? I think with an Alnatura you step in there and you know ah you know it feels good um, and somehow they are only organic products and I know actually also the people who work there are are paid in a fair way and I also know that suppliers uh, you know who supply the products are also paid in a fair way. Whereas, you know, if you go to Aldi and Lidl, um, they also started to have organic products, right? Which is, first of all, a good thing. But then, you know, um, they are also non-conventional, uh, conventional, non-organic products right beside it. And you don't know the payment schemes, how they are they treating their suppliers, etc. And so it's about consistency. And we, we believe that it's really important to be consistent and uh, to build up a brand that's trustworthy and transparent and we believe that it's going to be an edge. And do you think that going back to the example of LD and El Natura, you could actually at some point also provide your products to the Deutsche Bank and the Commerzbank and the established more banking competitors as a, you know, the, the tour of <laughs> bank sustainable ETF? Yeah, I, I think that that's definitely one thing. I mean, we cannot prohibit anyone from, from buying our investment products maybe uh, through another uh, channel, which I think is, is, is totally fine. And maybe it's the first step going, you know, more sustainable that you in, make some investments, uh, you know, in the right investment product. And then the next step is to make your actually a bank account green and switch your whole um, bank connection. But yeah, it could be um, a first, um, you know, a, a, a first um, step. Totally, yeah. And I think that comes to, to the last question of the chat. I think one of the maybe roadblock at the moment is, is consumer adoption. So do you have to actually make a lot of education? And you were mentioning earlier the, the meetups mm -hmm. that you're organizing. Is this something that you really um, need to, to do to have the necessary buy-in from, from the consumers or does that come naturally? Um. Yes, I think uh, totally. I think there is an, a huge educational effort. And I think the, the key question is how can you make it so interesting and the message so simple that people will join? And hopefully people will not only join tomorrow because only it's sustainable, but, but because, you know, um, they, they feel attached to the brand and maybe attached also to the, to the product. And then sustainability is at the core, but it's maybe not the first thing why they... Uh, why, why, why they come uh, to it. If, you know, if you look at Patagonia, for example, mm -hmm. these days are quite hip brand. And a lot of people started to, to buy Patagonia, you know, uh, clothes because they find, hey, they're really cool. And yeah, at the, at the heart, it's a sustainable company, for example, but maybe it's second, yeah? And it, I think that's where you want to get, get to. You know, I'd say because we are at the core, we have the sustainability mission but we want to um, really build cool products, a cool brand, and people you know, will connect with us also through that agenda. And it's not only the, the head that says, ah, I should switch because it makes so much sense and ah, I feel bad about my existing bank. No, but it's more a pull mechanism. Say, I want to go there because it's cool or because their, their card looks so cool um, or because I want to be part of that cool community. You know, uh, So we hope that uh, that we can create that spark and and these shared values exactly
If exactly. there is uh, no more questions, I think um, we passed the, the hour and, uh, and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks a lot, Inas, for all these insights. Um, it was very helpful to understand your, your business mm -hmm. model and to understand your journey as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. as a social entrepreneur. So thanks a lot for answering our questions and the question of our audience. Um, I guess I would like to also thank those that are still online um, and uh, hopefully you uh, find uh, this, uh, this Fireside chat useful and uh, insightful and uh, you're becoming now and you've already subscribed to Tomorrow Bank um, and have opened a bank account uh, there. Stay tuned because we're gonna also have uh, our next event um, still this month on the 30th of June, starting at 6 p.m., um, welcoming another social entrepreneur, uh, Sarah Brun, uh, who is the founder of Social Bee and Bring a Ring. Um, we will talk about her business model and how she would like to um, bring social entrepreneurship outside of his niche, a little bit like you and us, um, as well as empowering uh, women to become um, more leaders. And also um, we'll talk about the, the COVID-19 crisis and how she uh, took that crisis to, to uh, develop a new business model and, and take this challenge and, as a new opportunity. So hopefully we'll see uh, a lot of faces uh, again uh, on the 30th of June. And uh, in the meantime, thanks again, Inas. Thanks, Ulrike, for uh, moderating this chat. Uh, thanks for our team, uh, Marie and Philippe, uh, for the logistics and the behind the scene. Um, and uh, yeah, I will wish uh, you a very nice evening and hopefully see you next time. Thank you very much, Sabine and Ulrike, and everyone who attended. Um, and um, I also wish you um, a nice evening. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Inas. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.